Hey guys, and welcome back to the Leia Heilpern Show. As always, it is powered by Icon Plus. So some really quick news for you before I introduce a pretty exciting guest. So um, very exciting news from Icon and the popular destination Juju Island. The earlier announced blockchain-based COVID ID contact tracing app that is using Icon's DID technology is now fully operational. So some news as always from Icon there. Now, I want to say thank you to my sponsors, BlockFi. I use them to earn up to 8.6% interest on my USDC. So that is pretty insane. I'm gonna leave a link for you. You can actually get $250 when you sign up. So that is some incredible, passive income for you. So I would definitely recommend that I use that. So they're a really great um, platform for you. Now, before I bring on my guests, just a really quick thank you to um, CoinFlip. So they are doing some incredible work across the state to push Bitcoin mass adoption. They now actually have 1,422 Bitcoin ATMs, which provide access to the everyday people. So if you're interested in getting some Bitcoin, then you can get 10% off all your transactions. I'll leave the discount code for you. Now, joining me today is a major international New York Times bestselling author known for accidental billionaires and Bitcoin billionaires, as well as many other different stories. So it is, of course, Ben Mesmerick. Ben, great to have you. How are you doing? Thank you. I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. This is this is fun. So awesome. Yeah, I'm really excited to chat to you. Um, I'm a huge fan of the stories, especially as somebody um, that's a Bitcoiner. I'm an absolute fan. So I want to kind of go back a little bit, though, because you're obviously very well known um, as a journalist, as a storyteller, um, you know, from the movie, um, The Social Network and, and all of this stuff. But can you sort of take talk to us a little bit about you? Because who is Ben? How did you... How did you get into um, journalism? How did you get into storytelling? And also, how would you sort of define yourself? Yeah, so I've wanted to be a writer since I was a little kid. Um, I was about 12 when I decided that's all I wanted to do with my life. Um, I sold my first book right out of college. Um, but it wasn't an easy process. I was rejected a lot. I, I, was, I had written, a, locked myself in an apartment and wrote uh, nine books the year I graduated from college which I don't recommend to anyone, but was rejected by everyone in publishing. I got about 190 rejection slips. Um, and uh, my first book came out, nobody read it. And so I used to write medical thrillers, um, sci-fi kind of stuff until I met the MIT Blackjack team. I started going to Vegas with these guys. I was kind of blown away by it. And I wrote a book called Bringing Down the House, which was about these MIT kids who took Vegas for millions of dollars. It became the movie 21. And so yeah. I became a journalist by accident. I never intended to be wow. a fiction writer. I wanted to just write thrillers, but that book took off. So my next, you know, 15 books or whatever were true stories. You know, I'm always looking for these revolutionary stories about young people doing something really cool. Um, and late one night, I got a weird email um, from a Harvard senior who said, my best friend founded Facebook and, and no one's ever heard of him. And it was Eduardo Saverin's roommate. Eduardo came to me, and um, and that began the process of of what became the social network. So that was a really an accident as well. These things have all kind of fallen in my lap, and uh, and so I, I describe myself as an author, as a writer. It's all I've ever wanted to be. Um, but I I have a deep connection to Hollywood. So I usually write. You know, I find a story, I write a proposal, I sell it as a movie or a television show, then I write a book. And um, so I'm known as a book writer, but really I think my interests are both, you know, visual and 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 in the book form. And uh, and yeah, I guess uh, you know I'm I'm a, I'm an eccentric, reclusive writer. <laughs> but uh, but you know, I love it. I fortunately found myself in the center of of multiple big stories. Um, so um, I always loved Michael Crichton, and I always my favorite thing about him was the way he would sort of write a story and suddenly everyone was talking about that topic, you know, mm. whatever it was. And so that's always what I've tried to do. It's, it's, it's find something that's really at the moment um, that it's, you know, the origin of something big and cool. Um, so, you know, every, every book I want to be about dinosaurs, <laughs> but you know, there's only so many dinosaurs in the world. And so luckily I found, you know, Winklevoss twins. <laughs> so it's, uh, yeah. it's been the same kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, I think, okay. So firstly, I absolutely, um, I'm mind blown by the way you can sort of say you became a journalist by accident. Like that is, 
that is insane you know like these days you've got to you've got to get that degree you've got to go to you know university wow like you've got well, to get that work there's, there's a fair number of critics that like the new york times who think i'm not a journalist so let's be fair i did not get the degree i don't have the journalism degree i, I would be a very bad newspaper man um because mm -hmm. hey the important thing is the story it's the thrill yeah. it's fun it's these heroes and it's not essentially the little details that one has to to pay attention to if one is a, a real journalist. So yeah, I did fall into true stories by accident. Never, I wanted to write thrillers. I wanted to write sci-fi or, or you know, Da Vinci Code. I wanted to write the Da Vinci Code. And, and somehow I found true secret things going on. Um, you know, Bitcoin was one of them, but but the things that I found are, are something the whole mainstream doesn't quite know about yet. Um, that's always what I'm looking for. Yeah, and I think, um, I mean, this goes without saying, you absolutely smashed that, um, you know, from Facebook to Bitcoin, it goes without saying, but you've had a pretty interesting week because you caught the attention of one of the richest, actually, apparently the richest man on earth, Elon Musk. So you said that you wouldn't turn being, um, you wouldn't turn down being paid in Bitcoin again. So who did you turn down Bitcoin from? And also well, what was it you know, like to get that attention? True, but like, so when I wrote Bitcoin Billionaires, I had an opportunity to take the payment for the project in Bitcoin, um, oh, and uh, uh, you know, it's funny as as a as a writer, I'm always the fly on the wall. You know, I sit there and I watch and I listen and I and I tell people stories and I'm writing about these incredible revolutions that are going on. Um, but weirdly, I always see myself as not part of it, but someone watching and detailing the story. Not that mm. to be objective, but real. My reality is so warped to me. It's almost like this this movie that I'm watching and then I'm retelling this movie. So of course I should have taken it in Bitcoin. I knew, I, I you know. As Did much you know as though? Did you know, no? I've been a believer in Bitcoin, you know, for a very long time. And, and the same way with Facebook, you know, I wrote the Facebook story before Facebook was anything and I had not yeah. to be a part of that. And, and I've done that in a, in a lot of places. You know, I've, I've written books that have made a lot of other people very wealthy. Um, but the thing is, is for me, that's not really my job. Um, you know, I need, I need a financial advisor to read my books and then tell me what to do. <laughs> um, so yes, I, I, I was, I was onto Bitcoin very early. Of course there were people who were onto it way earlier than me. Um, you know, Bitcoin billionaires came out, Bitcoin was at 3000 a coin. Um, so, you know, of course, had I taken it in Bitcoin, I'd, I'd be retired right now, but, but un unfortunately, no, you'd still be uh, writing. I, I became the objective writer. So it's interesting. I'm kind of this like Bitcoin maximalist or whatever you want to call it, even though I personally have limited stake in, in how Bitcoin actually does, other than my belief that, you know, the, the that I, I'm supporting people who are going to do incredibly well with it. And that in turn supports me. Um, so it's not like I'm disinterested. Bitcoin billionaires as a book and as a movie rests on Bitcoin being bigger and bigger and bigger. But um, but I, I, I've been a believer for a long time. I think it makes sense. I think it's smart. I think it's you know it's 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 a currency, but also a store of value that works in the world we're moving towards. Um, so I'm happy to see that it is getting there. But um, but yeah, I, I, unfortunately, I I, I turned down uh, opportunities to be much wealthier than I am. <laughs> Yeah, I think I, uh, I, I think we, I think we've all done that. We've all sort of made that mistake at some point. But I'm gonna get to sort of your opinions on Bitcoin and, and where you see it in a bit. But I want to talk about um, the social network, um, the accidental billionaires, um, because, like you said, you received that really weird sort of encrypted message from Eduardo yeah. um, out of absolutely nowhere. So just tell us what on earth were you thinking? Um, right. Yeah, so I go for it. Yeah, I was the email. There's this guy named Will McMullen who was one of Eduardo's roommates at Harvard. This was 2009, I would guess it was. It was a while and For ago. those who don't know who Eduardo is, just so if you watch the social network, Eduardo Saverin is the is the one who co-founded Facebook, and then Mark kicked him out of the company. Um, Eduardo ended up suing for billions and billions of dollars, um, and called me. <laughs> so I didn't know this at the time. But Eduardo had reached out to me in this sort of Machiavellian idea that he was in the midst of suing Zuckerberg, um, who had cut him out entirely, um, diluted him to zero. He wasn't even on the masthead of Facebook anymore. Um, and he thought if I could, if he could talk to a writer, uh, it would scare Zuckerberg enough that Zuckerberg would pay him off. And that's exactly what happened. You know, he basically came to me, and we spent you know some months talking about it. And I wrote a book proposal. So I wrote a 14-page yeah. book proposal 
which I think I called Face Off. <laughs> <Even though, laughs> okay. There's already a movie called Face Off. Anyways, it was called Face Off. And my book proposal leaked onto the internet, onto a website called gawker.com, if you remember Gawker. And that day, Facebook settled with Eduardo for what became $5 billion. And on the top of the settlement agreement, it says you may never speak to Ben Mesrick again, because they were hoping to just cut him off and cut me off and make it not happen. So he took his $5 billion and disappeared to Singapore, never to be heard from again. And he cut off all contact with me. He should send me a gift basket. I mean, I got the yeah, guy just $1 billion. One billion? Yeah, just, you one know, billion. why not? I don't even need billion. Billion. 10 million, Eduardo. Where are you, Eduardo? I hope <laughs> one million. <laughs> yeah. But, but in any event, he got very rich and he disappeared. But I already had enough to write the book. And then I met yeah. the Wimbledon twins. So I reached out to them on Facebook of all places. I you know, knew they were part of the Funny. story um, and they were very generous with their time and proceeded to sort of be sources for what became the social network. Now at the time, they were the bad guys in the story. Yes. I saw them as kind of the bad guys. They were the big giant blonde guys who were chasing the karate kid around the gym, just the skeletons, right? I mean, that that's how I, cause I grew up, the eighties were a big part of my life. And, and right. to me, those are the eighties bad guys. Those are the guys in every eighties movie who beat yes. up the good guy. So that's how I saw them. I didn't think much beyond that. I knew they were incredible athletes. I knew they had this incredible, uh, you know, deep like American belief in entrepreneurialism and getting back up if you're down. They don't lie. These are very honest guys, which I think was very intriguing. In the whole social network, they're the only two people who don't ever lie. Um, everyone else is kind of duplicitous and you know, there's Sean Parker, there's Zuckerberg, there's Eduardo. But the 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 Winklevoss twins are straight, you know. They they end up being the bad guys because because they're so straight in a way. Um, yeah. So yeah. So I never thought I'd write about them again. I thought that was the end of that story um, until years later. Um, so yeah, I don't know if you want me to go into the Bitcoin story. Yeah, I'll ask you. No, no, we'll get there. But um, just at that moment though, um, did you realize what Facebook was? Right, like like you said, you sort of stumbled onto two revolutions: Facebook right. and Bitcoin. So you stumbled onto Facebook. Did you have any idea that it was going to be Facebook? And also just not just Facebook, but just like the beginning of Dang something new. Revolution. So before it really got to me, yeah, my wife was on Facebook and that was about all I knew about it. You know, you okay. know, pictures that I didn't know what was going up. And I was like, what is this thing that everyone's on? I knew about it. You know, I had gone to Harvard. So we'd hear, you know, everyone kind of oh, okay. on it and stuff like that. Um, but in the process of talking to Eduardo and then Sean Parker, I spent a lot of time with Sean, um, with all these other kind of insiders. I, I really started to believe this was life changing. It wasn't just my okay. space, you know, or Friendster or one of these other yeah. things that would come before. Facebook was going to change the fabric of all of our lives. Now, yeah. I also believe that Zuckerberg um, was megalomaniacal. He was one of these people who was believed that we should all be on Facebook. He didn't believe in privacy. He didn't believe that you should hide things from other people because the world becomes a better place if we share everything. So he wanted to turn the world into this Facebook village. And there are mm -hmm. dangers to that, which we are now seeing. Um, but I really thought, you know, this is a revolution. This is life changing. This is a world built, you know, for people who who don't want to interact in person, but want to interact online. And that's where we were moving towards. So I did see it as a revolution. And that's why I wrote the book. It wasn't just a book about another company. I never saw it as that. And I'll tell you what, Aaron, when Aaron Sorkin and Fincher got involved, I remember when Aaron Sorkin told me the title is going to be The Social Network. And I thought, yeah. that's, hard. that's a horrible title. I didn't think much of it. Um, right. And when you think about it, it actually is a really good title because the point is, is that this could be anything. It, it didn't have to be a specific company. It didn't have to be, you know, about a guy who makes a billion dollars. The point was, this is the network that we now all live on. Mm. Um, and that's kind of why that title works so well. So, so yeah, I did see it as a revolution at the time. But did you, I mean, you don't have to go into too much detail on this, but given what we've seen with Donald Trump, you know, his sort of social media ban this week, did you think ever that you, that we would get to, that you'd be working on a platform which, or covering a platform which actually bans the sitting president of the United States? It's, it's been a wild run. I will say, I think with the social network, we got Mark Zuckerberg exactly right. And we got mm -hmm. what Facebook was going to become exactly right. Um, okay. If anything, you know, I predicted that we would all spend most of our days on Facebook at this point. I really thought Facebook, I didn't see Twitter coming, you know. I uh, okay. Facebook would be the thing that where we, where I thought it would encompass all of that. Because I really felt like he was creating a platform where you didn't need to do anything else. You didn't need to have another yeah. internet. It was a whole silo 
that we would all live inside of. Um, interestingly enough, there are five of them or whatever. Um, Facebook didn't swallow them all. It tried <laughs> and it swallowed out. Yeah. Them, but it didn't swallow all of them. But yeah, you know, we are in a crazy moment where these things are dangerous. And listen, we, you and I, I can you as well. We live on Twitter. We live on Facebook. We, we use these things because they are such a big part of how we reach people and how we speak to people and how I get my stories. People pitch me things on Twitter all the time and it, and it works for me. But they're also dangerous because they also bring out this sort of dark underside of the world um, where, you know, people aren't responsible necessarily for what they say or they do. And that's dangerous. Um, so there needs to be a, a way to make people responsible for what they say and do. I love Twitter, but the thing I hate about Twitter is that nobody is responsible for anything they say. And that's not a good thing. Um, you, you know, you should be able to say what you want on Twitter, but there will be ramifications to it. And, and that's, that's not a bad thing. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, an interesting, it's an interesting world. Yeah, I think it's interesting what you say about Facebook when you say it sort of wanted to be everything, just because in my opinion, I actually think that's its downfall. Um, I think what Twitter does really well is that it just stays to one thing and I hate the fleets. Um, I think, no, it just needs to stay to one thing, just conversation in a niche market. And I think that's what it does well. But, yeah, um, absolutely. You know, the simpler, the better. I, yeah. I, for me, that's how I use Twitter. I mean, I never really got into all the other magical things that <laughs> you can do with it. But listen, Twitter is world changing. It's brilliant. And, and I think it can be this incredible tool. Um, we've seen it used incredibly well so many ways. But at the same time, there are dangers to it. And I think that, you know, we see that happen all the time as well. So what were your initial thoughts about Mark Zuckerberg? Um, he's sort of this controversial character. Right. Well, you know, Mark he's... doesn't like me very much. Let's put it that way. I, I really wanted to interview him. I wanted to sit down with him and get the story directly from him. And he just refused. I spent a year with really? him. Um, you know, I got to Sean Parker, who was a very big source, the Winklevoss twins, you know, Eduardo, all of these people around him. But Mark just wouldn't talk to me. He couldn't control what I was going to write. He was afraid because I was talking to the Winklevi that, that, you know, I was biased against him, whatever. Um, but I, I think he's an absolute genius. I think he really yeah. has the power behind what Facebook is and became. I don't think he sees the world the rest the way the rest of us do. I think he's very socially awkward and strange. I think he, he's, he's one of these people who is happiest and most comfortable in front of a computer screen. And everything else, you know, is, is a delusion to him. I think he's very much um, this regimented automaton. <laughs> I think he's, a, he's somewhat a robot. And I think to him, Friendships don't mean the same thing they mean to everyone else, at least from Eduardo's perspective. Eduardo thought Mark was his best friend. I don't think Mark ever thought that about Eduardo. And so I think that there's this disconnect between him and people, um, which is a little scary when you think about it. But I also am, am, am amazed and, and, and intrigued by him. I think he's incredible. I'd happily write a Mark Zuckerberg book if he wanted to come tell me his story. Um, the social network is, is from the point of view of Eduardo, I think. I think more than it is, mm. it's from the point of view of the people around him. And I think you can tell a very good true story from the point of view of the people who surround a story, um, ne not necessarily meeting the man in the center. Um, but it would be a very different story told from Mark's point of view. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. I did, that didn't really occur to me um, when I sort of followed the story um, that it was from Eduardo's perspective. That's pretty interesting. Yeah. I mean, if you read Action of Billionaires, it's definitely more more from Eduardo's point of view yes. than the social network. I think Aaron Sorkin worked very hard to tell it from Mark's point of view. Um, so there, okay. that, that is a very different perspective, I think. Um, but um, listen, it's a great movie. I, I think it's it is. one of the best movies of the last 10 years, and I think uh, it will remain that way um, you know, for a while, yeah. So, so Bitcoin billionaire sort of begins where this one finishes. So can you tell us where you first heard about what was going on, right? Mm -hmm. Like you have the Winklevi, which I still find so funny that people call the Winklevi. Um, you have them sort of coming into all this money, going to Silicon Valley, nobody wants to work with them. They go to Ibiza, like, how did you even hear about this story? Yeah, so I, you know, I was done. I didn't think I was gonna write about the Winklevoss twins again. They were perfectly nice. We got along great. Um, they even came to the movie premiere. <laughs> they were nice. cool guys. But, um, but I thought their story was over. Bitcoin was something that people had been pitching me blockchain and Bitcoin, you know, because I'm a writer mm. in that world, but I was not interested. You know, math and it was the word blockchain. I hate that word. I didn't it's want a terrible to, word. I don't want to write about Bitcoin. Um, and then I, my wife was reading the New York Times and there was an article and it, this, the title of the article was Bitcoin, the, the, the Winklevoss twins are the first Bitcoin billionaires. And I was like, is, is this possible? How did these guys do this? And so I called yeah. them up 
And I went out to New York and I sat down with the twins and I was like, tell me what's going on here. And I was blown away by the idea that these guys were at the forefront of two revolutions. You don't usually see that. Their story should have been over. Um, they got a payday out of Facebook that you know ended up being a lot of money. Um, it was originally 67 million, but they took it in stock and ended up being yes. you know, half a billion dollars. And they smartly um, you know, uh, ended up in something else. And, and so as they proceeded to tell me all about Bitcoin and sort of how they found it and, and why it was a revolution, I, I began to see more and more that this was something really important and significant. And the fact that they had bought so heavily, you know, as many as 200,000 coins, $7 a coin, um, uh, that it was going to be life-changing, not just for them, but that they became part of the story in such a very big way. Um, and, and, and so I dove in and uh, over the course of a year with them and following all the different, you know, Charlie Schramm and all the different OGs in the Bitcoin world that I could speak to, um, Eric Voorhees and Roger, Roger Ver and all these different people, uh, I learned a lot and I, I sort of, you know, I'm not an expert in, in, in any way like someone who could actually do computer stuff, but I think I've become an expert in terms of what Bitcoin is and what it means mm. and why it's important and why it's significant. And, and in that process, um, yeah, I became a believer. Um, but as a writer, for me, the important thing is this thriller, this story. I would not have ever written about Bitcoin if it were not the Winklevoss twins, um, because that's to me what sells this story. You know, it's yeah. not just that there's a bunch of people who figured out a way to make money better. Uh, the story is these, these guys who were the bad guys in the social network fell into a whole nother revolution and rode a whole nother crazy drama to great success. Um, and that's fun. And so that's that's why I wrote it. Yeah. So do you think it's a coincidence then that you have these guys who, you know, are they, they come from a wealthy background, you know, they're at Harvard, um, but actually they're at the forefront of two huge revolutions. And I think actually, like, I'm going to predict this. I'm going to say like Facebook and Bitcoin will be the two biggest revolutions of the next decades to mm -hmm. come. Um, just just because I think they've set the foundation, right? Like something else bigger could come along. But like, I think that will be a sort of product of these two things. So yeah, I mean, I think you're probably right. But I think, you know, I don't think it's an accident or a coincidence that they happen right. to be there twice. I think it goes back to who they are. And you get that out. Mm. Of the book. But these are guys who, yes, they do come from great wealth. So you could see them just riding off into the sunset after Facebook. But these are guys who really feel that they want to build something, that they, mm. that they have to prove something, that they have to do something great. And that comes from their father and from their background. These are not guys who would ever just sit around on a beach for a year. These are very intense people. And that's kind of how they come out as the bad guys in the social network. Yes, Their I understand. is real. If you spend time with them, they're very intense. And there's two of them. <laughs> so it's not like, you know, you feel like they can do anything. And I think that they they set out to find a revolution. Um, they wanted yeah. to create something great. They felt like it was robbed. They were stolen. Um, they believed that they were the reason that Facebook succeeded, that they were the people behind some of the smart things that made Facebook work and that Mark stole it from them, that he cheated them, that he lied. And they weren't going to sit down and let that happen. They were going to find another way to build something great. And so when they stumbled into Bitcoin, that's what drove them to, to be so crazy, to take a mm. risk and, and to dive in headlong. Um, so I don't think it's a coincidence, but, you know, they they managed to, you know, find something great twice. Um, and and that that's, doesn't happen often. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's pretty it's pretty insane. I think it's kind of one of those things where it's kind of like I think luck is just a manifestation of being incredibly prepared, you yeah. know, of preparation. You know, so. If you look at it this way, they were lucky to stumble into Bitcoin when it was $7 a coin. And you could say they were lucky to have the money to buy that many coins. But most people would buy at $7 and sell at $14 or exactly. $20 or $100 or $1,000 or $10,000 or or well, even the Facebook shares, you know. So how do you hold it all the way to here? That's not luck anymore. No. Um, that's a belief in something. That's doing your research and deciding if this is the next big thing. Um, so a lot of us could have gotten lucky and bought Bitcoin. And this is how I, you know, feel better about myself. I could have taken Bitcoin at three thousand, and I would have sold it at six thousand. It's very yeah. unlikely I would have had the guts to hold it all the way to here. Um, and most people didn't. Um, so. You know, it's it's uh, you have to give it to them. They definitely believed uh, 100% in what they were doing. 
So in the first one, you, like we said, they were sort of the jocks. They sort of came across quite evil. In the second, you know, we, we sort of learn a bit more about them and we, we like them a bit more. So how did they sort of take to that portrayal of them in the first one? And actually, you know, they were, I guess, okay with it because they were happy to go on and do the second. I mean, listen, they don't agree with all of that portrayal. I, I think okay. it was fantastic. Army was amazing in it. Um, and, and they, I think they really, you know, they saw aspects of themselves that definitely came out. And to be fairless, no one else was telling their story. Um, this was their story being told in a very big way. Um, and they had essentially been cut out of history. You know, Facebook was this huge thing and they were being left behind. Um, and mm. so both them and Eduardo saw this as their reckoning, you know, that here we are. But the Winklevoss twins definitely believed they were more than, you know, these guys who were just rowing and eating in the dining hall. <laughs> they felt yeah. like they were guys who were doing something great and, and Mark sort of snuck in and, and stole it. But I think overall, they love the social network. They believed that it was a true telling of the story. Um, you know, I've seen them interviewed about it and they, they, they said it was a good, good telling of what happened that year. Um, but they are much more than that. And I think that comes out later, yeah. So if you sort of have to look back and, and sort of think, you know, all of all of this has happened, what are your thoughts then just on, I guess, on all of it now? Because we, we've seen, you know, they've, so I'm looking at, I'm looking at Mark Zuckerberg and I'm looking at the Winklevoss twins and sort of what they've done. And yeah. we've got the Winklevoss twins with Gemini and then we've got um, Mark Zuckerberg who's just started well, not just started, but they're sort of pushing with, with Libra. Right, Libra. Quite interesting. Libra interns, right? <laughs> so it's really funny. I believe that, I've always said this, that I think Zuckerberg wakes up every morning thinking of the Winklevoss twins. And I think oh, the Winklevoss twins wake up every morning thinking about Zuckerberg. They deny that. They say that's not true. But I feel like that there's this Shakespearean drama between these people, that they're locked into this massive battle that goes on for decades. There's no way in my mind that Zuckerberg does not know about Gemini and the Winklevoss twins in Bitcoin. I mean, come on. And then he launches, he launches his own coin called Libra. There's no way that's a coincidence, okay? It's just, a, it's a weird thing going on. I think that Zuckerberg is looking at crypto. He has to be. I mean, everybody in the industry is looking at crypto and he yeah. wants to be a part of it. He knows it's something that they missed. Most of Silicon Valley missed it. They just didn't see this happening. And yeah. the Winklevoss twins did. And so in a lot of ways, what's really cool about the story is it's flipped on its head. You know, Facebook was the revolution and the Winklevoss twins were the establishment. And now yeah. the Winklevoss twins are the revolution and Facebook is the establishment. I mean, you can't ask for more storytelling than that. Um, so yeah. it's a perfect kind of situation. But yeah, I don't think Zuckerberg's going to leave it alone. And I think we're going to see them move into crypto in a big way. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's pretty insane um, because I, I think you're absolutely right in terms of like that flip, um, flip yeah. on its head, that 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 flip on it, on the establishment. But then what are your thoughts on sort of just Facebook right now, I guess, because a lot of people, and in my opinion, I sort of feel like it's declining. Like I don't use Facebook, I'm actually going to delete it. Right. Um, I just, I, I actually don't know how to delete it. That's the only reason why I still <laughs> right, have right, right. But, we've um, moved on, but we haven't moved on and we're all on Instagram though. So it's like, you yeah, know, so they own it. They own, yeah. I mean, what's the difference? Uh, Instagram is essentially overtaking, I think, Facebook, at least in a generation that's going on now in, in terms of the importance to their life. But it's still Facebook. I don't I don't see a distinction between Facebook and Instagram. So if you're going to include Instagram in that, no, I don't think it's losing any power over the over the younger people. I think Facebook as itself feels clunky now. It feels too slow. It feels, you know, dirty. There's all these crazy, you know, political stuff going on. There's fake stuff going on. But yeah. I still use it in terms of just looking at memories and pictures. I think that's the fun part about Facebook right now. But I don't really use it to communicate so much. Um, I don't use it as I did maybe seven years ago, right? But I use Instagram way more than I would have thought a year ago, because it's a fun, quick, it's more streamlined, it seems more what Facebook was. Um, but yeah, in terms of Facebook itself, I could foresee it becoming less and less the important part of the giant you know thing that's dominating our lives but mm -hmm. it doesn't really matter to me what format is it's all the same it's this social network it's the idea that we're on this internet based yeah. society now um, um so there will be better and better forms of it um but i think we're all still a part of it i don't think you're going to get away from it by the leading facebook I was watching um, I was watching a Netflix documentary about social networking and, and all this stuff and they have um, they have actual ethical positions right like so you know how you have like um, like an officer for like diversity and gender and all this stuff like they now have like the ethics 
right. on social media. So you've got to give me your take. What do you think is going on? Because, you know, it's it's addictive um, it, that, you know, it's the, the privacy and the data issues. Um, there are a lot of ethical issues. So what's your take? Yeah, I mean, I think that Facebook really, uh, it, it became dangerous simply because they worked very hard to make sure it's a part of all our lives and important to, mm -hmm. all. to do that. They had to find tricky ways to get us all addicted to it. And they had to study ways of getting us more and more addicted to it. And then the fact that they make money off of our data, it really leads to these enormous ethical issues about privacy and things like that. And as generations come up, they care less and less about privacy because of it. I think yeah. younger people don't care about privacy so much. They want to put things on Instagram and Facebook. You know, they put themselves in front of their house on Facebook, on Instagram all the time, not thinking about what information that gives away because, and I do too, listen, because it, it, we want to share, we want, we all want to be, you know, in front of everyone we know. It's just, we're social animals. And, and in the COVID situation, we see it more and more. People want connection so badly that they're willing to put all their data up. And then places like Facebook monetize it, which is the scary part. Um, so there are huge ethical questions and issues that come to something like this. Um, but they, putting that aside, I don't think this is a bad thing. I think the idea mm -hmm. that Facebook started with and then Mark started with was not bad. I don't think he okay. wanted to rule the world as an evil emperor. I think he really believed the world is a better place if we're one big village. If we all, you know, if you know the person who lives in another country personally on Facebook, that makes you closer to them and less likely to fight with them, right? It, it, in a way, it does work. You do have a happier world if we can all connect. I think that's all true. So the question is, how do we have a happier world that we all connect in, knowing that there's all these bad people in it, <laughs> knowing that there's all these people who have nefarious reasons to want to connect, or people who want to make money off of connecting, or all these different things? How do you work with that? And so these are big, difficult, ethical questions that have to be answered. And I think as Facebook grew, that wasn't their goal, answering these ethical questions. The only goal was grow. How do we grow and grow and grow? Now, mm -hmm. they're gonna have to look back and say, okay, we can't do this, we shouldn't do this, you know? And so I think it's okay that they're hiring people to sort of look into this. I think yeah, regulation, self-regulation is, is better than outside regulation, but self-regulation is being proven not to work. So yeah. you really need to find ways to, to regulate this stuff in a way to make it healthy. Um, and to make it happy, but I don't have the answers. Look at you. Look at what's going on with politics and parlor and Twitter. And there's no good answer to all this sort of thing. There are answers, and some people are going to hate those answers, and some people aren't. I mean, you shouldn't use Twitter to foment, you know, negative things, violence and revolution and all that kind of stuff. But on the other hand, you should be able to use Twitter to state your opinions. So how do you how do you how do you police that? And that's not an easy thing. I don't think there's an easy way to look at it. Yeah, I think it's a topic that you can just speak about for ages, um, you know, especially given everything that's going on right now. But I think the biggest thing, which not just, forget like the deplatforming of the bloody, you know, president of the United States, the sitting president, forget that. Um, despite the tweet that he was uh, deplatformed for not actually being something which incited violence at all. Um, yeah. Facts. Um, I think what kind of got me, though, was the um, the kind the the destruction of parlor. Like that got yeah. me because- well, It's an interesting thing, but here's the thing. And I, I have mixed feelings about all of this. I'm not gonna be on one side or the other. And I know there's gonna be people who are angry on both sides if I say something in the middle. But you know, listen, I think we need to live in a better world. We should yeah. be kind and great to each other and nice to each other all the time. And all of this device that needs to go away. So how do we get there? The end goal, okay, the end goal shouldn't be a party or polit politics or a point of view. The end goal should be everyone's happy and no one hurts anybody. That's the only goal we should be working toward. So the question is, how do you get to that goal? And if you think your way of getting to that goal is the right way, then you should put that forward. But if you think your goal, your way of getting that goal, that goal isn't important, then I don't know how we have a conversation. The goal is only a better, happier, safer world. And so for me, you know, I look at the parlor situation and yeah, I mean, there's monopolistic things going on and they're trashing stuff like this to try and, but what's the goal, you know? And that's what you have to keep in mind. I'm not saying it's right, but I'm just saying we have to keep one goal in mind. And so I don't know enough about parlor to make a decision about what was going on on there. I, I haven't been on them there. Um, so, you know, listen, people should be able to put their points of views up, um, but there needs to be policing of points of view. I really don't believe that free speech reaches the point where you can say, I wanna kill somebody. It just doesn't. 
You know why? If people can say things like that, then the world is worse. Uh, so okay. let's make the world better. You shouldn't be able to say anything you want. I really don't think that's what free speech is all about. You really shouldn't. You can't say hateful things. And if you're willing to say hateful things, people should be allowed to not listen to you. And if there's a way of doing that, um, we should do it. So I'm not a fan of, of, of violent hate speech. I, I don't think I ever will be. And I don't think someone can convince me that we should be a fan of violent hate speech. I'm not saying Parler is that. I don't know enough about Parler. But I can yeah. see a reason why we don't want to foment violent hate speech. I mean, I think that's something we should endeavor, self-endeavor. I think self-regulation is the way to do it, 100%. I think people should look at themselves and say, OK, this is a hateful, violent thing to say, so I'm not going to say it. But there are always going to be people who are always going to say hateful, violent things, right? So what do we do about that? Do we just let them say hateful, violent things? I mean, I think if you're, yeah. if you're a true libertarian and you don't care what the world looks like. You say everyone say anything you want. But I don't want that world. I, I don't want my kids to grow up in a world where people around them are just saying hateful, violent things because they have free speech. Do you? When your kids at school, do you want the person next to them to be saying hateful, violent things because they have the freedom to? I mean, you don't. You don't want your kids sitting next to someone saying that, right? So why are you okay with it on the internet? So I th okay. So I think school is a little different, but I think I think the, the problem the problem with, with sort of policing speech. Um, yeah. And I'm a huge fan of Jordan Peterson. Jordan Peterson to me is just like an idol. Like I'm in awe of everything he has to say. I can't fault him in the slightest. But he talks a lot about sort of looking at speech and sort of understanding. Um, you, there's hate and there's violence, right? So right. They're, they're two different things. And I think how how you know what might be hateful to you may not be hateful to somebody else. What might be offensive to you may not I be think from offensive. From a theoretical to point of view, you're absolutely right. But in reality, no. I think in reality, we kind of know what hate speech is. It's like pornography. You know what it is when you see it. You know hate yeah. speech when you see it. And we can play the the liter you know, the, the linguistic game all the time and say, well, to, to someone who you know lives there, that's not so hateful. But the reality is, you know it when you see it. And, and Well, I think it's, I do. You don't need to stop. You don't need to stop to tell you when you're committing a crime. You know when you're committing a crime. And I believe deep down that the people saying hateful things know they're saying hateful things. They know it, but they say it because they want to. I, I think there's a percentage of people that are just bad. Let's be yeah. honest, there are. And the problem with the libertarian point of view, and I, I am a libertarian, but the problem with the libertarian point of view is that there are very bad people out there. So you can't just- They're bad on the other side as well. I think, listen, I think There are bad people on both sides. So yes, it has to be equitable, 100%. I think there's plenty of things that both sides, I'm not liberal and I'm not on the left. I think there are plenty of things on both sides that are hateful, horrible things and should be pleased. I just don't believe in the free for all. I really don't. And, and I believe in freedom, you know, to an extent, but, but violence and hate, are just not good things and there should be a way to stop them. But I agree, I'm not the person who could make that decision. And that's where we get into problems. Who makes that decision? How do you make that decision? And we aren't at a point where we have an objective way of doing that. So I'm, I agree with you 100% that deplatforming people left and right is a very dangerous thing because God only knows who's, who's making decisions and how they're making those decisions. But I do agree that there are people who should be deplatformed. <laughs> so that's where we differ. I think that deplatforming the way it's done is is not equitable and it can be very dangerous. But I do believe there are people who should not be speaking. And that's 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 the way I look at the world. A small percentage of people should not have freedom of speech because they're bad people. And how do you pick those bad people out? I'm not saying they're on this side or on that side, but we all know that they exist, right? Yeah, I, I think often like that line gets blurred and I'm very much of the opinion sort of when you give an inch, they take a mile. And that's yeah. exactly what we see on Twitter because um, yeah. I've seen a lot of people being sort of banned for misgendering somebody by accident. Right. And and I agree with you 100 percent. Stupid. And you know what? Listen, I, I'm not a fan of this, this like canceling people for statement yeah. ideology. I mean, come on, I'm a writer, I'm a journalist. I think people should put their ideas out there, tell stories. I think it's disgusting when a professor writes an article and everyone disagrees with the article and they want to ruin his career. That's absurd, right? But I also think that there are people who say something hateful and violent and they, should, they, shouldn't, they shouldn't say it and they should be stopped from saying it. Um, it shouldn't be propagated. You know, if something is, is truly violent and hateful, it doesn't need to be amplified. 
I have um, a question. I have a question then, just on that point then. Um, so my mentality is, and my question to you is, often I quite enjoy hearing these things because it tells me who this person really is. Like I, yeah, it really the- shows me the truth. And can I, like, I really want to just take, I always, here's a really extreme example, right? So I want to take Hitler as an example. So I'm pleased that we are able to know what he said and what he did, and we can hear his true opinions. I just think it's so important to hear this um, because otherwise we don't know how long that war could have gone on for. You know, if things were, if things, you know, if, if we didn't hear, if the opposing side didn't come in, you know, if, if everything was done very quiet and, and you know, I mean, I know that was their goal anyway in Nazi right. Germany to be done quite quietly um but in those kind of cases i like i i'm glad that i know where he stands i'm you know there are plenty of um the the iranian um the iranian leader couple right. his name I, I don't know. he's on twitter now <laughs> yes, yeah, exactly he's on twitter right. but i know where he stands and i'm right. glad that i do um I, and now you're, you're right, you're i'm glad, I'm glad that i know and that jack hasn't deplatformed him yes but he's deplatformed Trump. Sure. So so I know the truth. Absolutely value in that. I agree. And there's that's the hard part is where you draw this line because you want to hear these people's points of view because you want to know where they stand and what they believe. And I think it's important to know that. But do you want it to then become a call to action? Did you want Hitler? No, I'm not call to action. No. Like if Hitler went on Twitter and was trying to rally people to do something awful, you'd be against it and you'd say, cut this yeah. Twitter. I'm not saying anybody is Hitler. But I'm saying there has to be a line. So someone has to draw the line. So you you do agree with me that there has to be policing. So that's the problem with the libertarian. It's just hard. It's hard, right. isn't it's it? Very it's hard it, it? You just disagree with where they're policing it, but not that they're policing it. I think I think I think I think I think it's just so hard to draw that line. And I'm very I'm very um conscious of giving an inch and them taking a mile. I mean, oh, honestly, if it was I nowadays don't think we disagree. I just think that I I'm 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 more jaded than you are. And I believe that there's just some bad, bad actors out there. And you know what? If if less people spoke, we'd be better off. <laughs> that's that's a, that's my jaded. Yeah, people, I get that there. You know, let's everyone just be quiet unless you have something really good to say. <laughs> because yeah. you know, don't say something unless it's not. What is it? Uh, if it's not nice, don't say it or whatever it was. Yeah. As a kid, like I just wish the world were like that. And I get yeah. that it's not. But I, I live in a delusional world. I live in a delusional, you know, fairyland with unicorns and and and, <laughs> Winklevi. and I want to live in a world with unicorns and Winklevi. And why can't I just live with that world? So I think, you know, I think my brothers uh, have always described me as like a Muppet. So when people ask me where, where politically you are, I'm like, I don't think Muppets have politics. <laughs> I think other than that eagle on the Muppets, all of the Muppets kind of were believed that the world just get along and go along. So I, I'm not, I don't really have a political point of view or a political horse in all of this, but I, I do understand that, listen, deplatforming people is dangerous and scary, but there are also people who should be deplatformed. But I think I can hold both those thoughts. And listen, okay. these are nuanced things. So you can't just say it on the internet. That's the other problem with the internet. I don't make any political statements on Twitter or anything like that because there's no nuance on Twitter. Anything you say is one side right. and, and, and flips, it, it will piss off a lot of people. I think in a conversation, it's great to have these conversations and it's important. Um, but there's no nuance on the internet, right? So that that makes it tricky to ever say anything. And the limited characters are exactly part of their um, part of their sort of gameplay. Um, so you are so you've been at the part, you've been at the center of two of the biggest revolutions of the decade. Not just the Winkle vibe, but you as well, of course, have been at the center and um, documenting it. So what can we expect? Um, any more interesting things coming up? I mean, I That's know you want to write. Chasing, I've been chasing Elon Musk. On I was my, about to say. I've had my midnight conversations. I really would love to do. And I know there's been an Elon Musk biography, which, which is great and all that kind of stuff. What I want to tell, if I could, is really a thriller about the specific things, he's this battle he's fighting against AI and to expand our consciousness and to reach Mars. I think there's a great thriller and movie to be told about this guy doing this crazy thing and 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 succeeding. So the way I would approach the story would be specific like that. I love I would love to write an Elon Musk book, um, but I don't have him landed. You know, I, for me, I need access to the main character or characters around him enough to tell me the story. I don't want to just write another story around Elon. I would love for him to just talk to me, and I think I could get there. But that's that's yeah. one thing I'm working on personally. I have a big book coming out. I wrote a. Uh, 
a serialized novella for the Boston Globe over the summer, which ran, it was called The Mechanic, and it was a Da Vinci Code style thriller going back to the American Revolution that was really fun and cool. I wrote it, chapter would go up one night and I'd literally write a chapter a day and it ran wow. for weeks and it was very successful. We had a huge readership. So I sold the movie to Steven Spielberg and Amblin and I'm writing the screenplay and then I'm working on, the book will be out next winter and then a, a sequel the following year. So that's, I don't have a big nonfiction book yet. So I'm looking for stories. So people want to tweet to me, send me a story. I'm, I'm always searching for a big enough story to tell. Uh, Elon, of course, would be a great one, but whatever I, mm -hmm. I, can, I can find in that world. But I, I, you know, to tell you what's next or what you should invest in next, um, I don't know, great question. Uh, I think what's going on in biology is awesome. I wrote a book called Wooly, um, which was all about CRISPR technology. And, and uh, but that's very hard. You know, it's not, it's not as easy to sell a, a book yeah. of science as it is anything else. So, uh, you know, I think what's going on with vaccines and COVID is a is a is another sea change and revolution. I think these new vaccines that have come out are going to change the world because you're going to have vaccines for cancer, you're going to have vaccines for Alzheimer's, you're going to have vaccines for everything. And you know, there's going to be people on both sides of that too. But um, but this mRNA technology is is really world changing. Um, but I don't know what's next. I'm always looking for the next big thing. I thought it was absolutely hilarious um, when Elon Musk replied to you just sort of saying, I don't have the time. <laughs> right. like, I need to, I'm, I'm trying <laughs> to save humanity. Listen, I don't want him to sit there and write books. I want him to change the world for the better. He's one of You me. can just follow him with your notepad and be I like, know, you do you. I, I, I think the Winklevoss twins can tell Elon that I don't bother you too much. You won't even know I'm there. I'm just like a fan. I'm like a fanboy. I, 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 I have been criticized by a lot of journalists that I fall in love with my main characters. And it's really true. Yeah. When I write about someone, to me, they're always larger than life, even when they're bad guys, um, like Rajan oligarchs or whatever else I've written about. I always kind of want to tell their story in the best way possible. So I would say to Elon Musk, I want to tell the story that you want to tell. Uh, I want to tell it the way you want to tell it, um, which is very different than like a biography or something like that. So we'll see if I get to him. Um, but, uh, you know, there's a lot of white whales out there. So I'll keep searching with my harpoon. Just last question for you then, because um, you said, you know, you're sort of living in this um, this fantasy world with your unicorns and the wink of eye and all this stuff. So Elon Musk has some pretty wild um, um, opinions. And one of them, which I would love one day to interview him about and just really just like, um, just really want to like scrutinize this idea of his is that we're living in a simulation. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm just so bothered by that um, and I really, I, I, I <laughs> like I don't I have some uh, I have some um like uh like what is it how do I put this have I have some ways I want to critique it basically but right. what do you think do you think okay. we're living in a I, simulation I, actually, I I'm a big believer in the simulation theory I have to say I'm not 100% convinced but I'm 9% uh -huh. convinced that we're it, not that it matters because I don't no. think it affect the simulation I don't think you can discover it and then not be in it anymore but I do feel that looking at the math of it that it seems very interesting to me. I mean, if you look at the development of, of AI and you look at the development of sort of how computer games work and you look at, you know, they getting better and better and better. I just look at the, the video games that I play today versus the video games I played when I was in college. You know that a hundred years from now, these video games are gonna be indistinguishable from reality. And then the idea that, that these non-human players, the computer players are gonna have their own intelligence at some point, it seems likely, uh, to me anyways, I know there are problems with that. Yeah, to me. So the idea that we're all in a simulation, just it, it kind of makes sense, right? I'm not saying you can actually see it or notice it. Yeah, of course. You know, it's really interesting. I, I've, I was blown away by simulation theory when I first fell into it years ago and uh, have done a lot of reading into it. Um, it doesn't change anything. That's the weird thing. But I, I do think I that, that's what's going on. What do you, you don't think so, or you don't want oh, No, 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 I'm, I'm cool with it. Like I'm, I'm, I'm an absolute, I'm, I'm an, I'm an absolute sci-fi freak. I love all that yeah. stuff. I'm, I'm down with that. Sure. Absolutely. That's yeah. fine. My issue is, but who says that we are the first to get there? That's what I'm saying. Like, I agree. Right. You know, we were doing, um, it was, it was just, um, a, 
like the pongs and the ball Maybe. and the you, you know what I mean yeah and then that now it's about now we can't really tell the difference so I get that we're gonna get there and I also think that like humanity this is probably you won't like this opinion but humanity is just so inherently flawed that I don't think we'll ever get to a point whereby we say that's immoral so we shouldn't control them right. definitely don't think that will happen definitely think we'll get there but who says that they're there before us why right. are we not the first ones I mean, we, you know, you could, <laughs> right? but if time is nearly infinite, then we couldn't be the first ones, right? Because over a, a, a vast amount of time, the likelihood that this moment in time is the first time that happened gets smaller and smaller and smaller. But um, why? I, I don't get that bit. That's the bit I don't get. There's an infinite point. There's infinite points along the timeline. Um, so it goes on and on and on and on and on. And there are essentially, potentially, infinite places this could be happening. Um, so there could be a planet uh, a billion miles away where they're making fake games also in another planet a billion miles away. So, and then on each planet, there are nearly infinite simulations. So the odds that this is base one become smaller and smaller and smaller the more chances there are, right? So let's say on Earth alone, there are a hundred million computers running simulations, right? And then there's base reality. So base reality, which is indistinguishable from the simulations, is now one of 100 million. So the chance that we are in base reality becomes one in 100 million, just on that one planet alone. So if you have an, 100 million planets, you can do the math, the chance yeah. that we're in base reality just gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, right? So eventually the idea that we're base reality almost becomes impossible because of the infinite okay. possibilities. So that's the math behind simulation. Yeah. If you run a simulation a million times, the chance that the first time you run it, it becomes one in a million. Um, you know, so that's that's the way they look at it. It gets confusing. But the other yeah. idea, well, maybe this isn't even possible. So in fact, there is no simulation because no, it's not even possible to make. Oh, it's so possible. <laughs> it's so possible. <laughs> so it gets really weird. But I love this kind of conversation. I think it's better drunk or stoned. But I'm definitely oh, yeah, a fan of of you know talking about the simulation theory. Yeah. Yeah, I agreed. Um, okay, so where can people find you? What are your final words? Um, yeah, I mean, I've been yourself. on Twitter. Um, that's the best place to find me. Or you know, yeah, that's you can you can you can message me on Twitter. I mean, you come to my Twitter, and then if you have some great idea or whatever like that. But I'm always sort of tweeting about Bitcoin and, and whatever else comes to mind. And uh, yeah, thanks so much. I appreciate it. Um, this was a lot of fun. Thanks so much for coming on. It's been absolutely amazing. Um, I had all those questions, so I'm so glad I got to talk to them, um, talk to you about them. So thank you so much. Um, and guys, don't forget to tune in next week, Thursday, um, 12 EST, back to normal time. Ben, thank you so much. Thank you. Awesome. Bye. Bye.